Hello and welcome to the i3 Insights podcast. My name is Wouter Klein and I'm the Director of Content for the Investment Innovation Institute. As you probably know, we love our disclaimers in this industry, so here's ours. The following recording is for educational purposes only. It does not constitute financial advice. Please enjoy the show. Welcome to the i3 Insights podcast. My name is Daniel Grioli and I'm the Market Fox columnist for i3 Insights. I'd like to give a big thank you to our steadily growing group of listeners. We really enjoy receiving your comments and feedback. Please get in touch by using the contact form on the i3 website. That's www.i3-invest forward slash contact. You can also follow us on Twitter at i3invest and at market underscore fox. Today I'm joined by Mike Ackard. He's the head of asset allocation at Research Affiliates. His career includes stints at the University of Virginia Investment Management Company, SunSuper and UBS Asset Management. Mike has recently returned to Australia to head up a local office and to do some interesting things with research affiliates, affiliate partners. And uh, it's all very exciting, and Mike will fill us in on the details shortly. I'm a big fan of research affiliates, or RAFI for short, their work on asset allocation. I've made it a point to review RAFI's long-term asset allocation forecasts each month for several years now. And their asset allocation interactive tool is fantastic. I can't wait to chat with Mike about these and many other interesting topics. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Mike to the podcast. Mike, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Daniel. It's great to to be here today. Um, We we have had a long presence in Australia over over 10 years through some affiliates. Um, And I think it was about now that we were thinking, how can we leverage that better? Um, with both our affiliates as well, current affiliates as well as some future affiliates that we can uh, work with closely. To do that, having my presence as an Australia and as an Australian here is, I think, very beneficial. And hopefully, with some success, we'll be able to have a lot more, uh, a lot bigger office here of quite a few more than just one person. Sounds interesting. So we'll come to this. Uh, local office and what you're doing with the affiliates a little later on but first we usually start off by asking our guests how they got into the investment business what's your background and how did you get to be where you are today with research affiliates I I'm a child of the 1980s Um, that was a, a beginning of sort of capitalism for me and any job that involved the Wall Street Journal or the Australian Financial Review was interesting to me. Unfortunately, I knew nothing about that. Uh, at university, I, I was a mathematician. That was my skill, and I did economics. And I was lucky, once I graduated, to be picked up by Stuart Piper at a Swiss Bank Corporation. He's, he's a very thoughtful, long-term investor and taught me a lot of my skills in terms of being thoughtful. Um, just as I joined that organisation, John Fraser took over, who is currently the Secretary of the Treasury. Um, but I spent the next 10 years travelling around with him, essentially, uh, being an investment person uh, for his different acquisitions and, and different um, investment management um, if, um, subsidiaries, I should call it, <laughs> throughout the world, both in Taipei, Uh, Japan, in Europe, in terms of working for the private bank, I learned a phenomenal amount about not only every asset class, having worked within equities, bonds, and then asset allocation, but also about the business, um, about how investment investment management companies are run, and how uh, acquisitions are made. The greatest learning I had there was the, the, the cultural impact that investment management has. Uh, the way uh, investors wish to manage their money in Taipei, 
Tokyo, Europe, Australia, and the US is just phenomenally different. And you can't take a style of investing that works really well in the US and put it in Tokyo and expect the clients to, to take it. We have to tailor it for local differences in um, cultural leanings. That's uh, an interesting perspective you have on the influence of culture. What do you think are some of the biggest differences between uh, how investors invest in Asia, say, and uh, the US? In the US, and I, I worked in the US for Gary Brinson, um, he had a very large stable of deep value investors. They signed on as a deep value investor. They were willing to ride through the, the late 1990s underperforming equity indices by 10% because they knew deep value was out of favour and it would come back. They, they stayed with that strategy and post 2000, they were richly rewarded. They lost, they, they gained back everything they lost and more. Within Asia, there is a far shorter term horizon, but they will not wait three or five years. They rarely will wait more than a year for performance to pay off. In Tokyo, um, you can't do sort of global currency betting because it just takes too long for it to pay off. In Taipei and China, uh, back then at least, and to a great um, extent now, they're more gamblers. You know, uh, they will make allocations to their equivalent of mutual funds or exchange traded funds very much looking for short-term gains. If you make a loss, they will hold you until it becomes a gain again. So that created just a whole pile of adverse selection issues and management um, that was so different to what we were expecting or, or used to in even sort of European or Australian investors and, and by far very different to the US. It's funny to hear you say that. You remind me of a story of uh, one of my friends who was, he works for a quantitative fund manager and he was sent to Hong Kong and they wanted him to pitch uh, low volatility equities through Asia. And he, his response was, are you serious? <laughs> Nobody's going to buy this in Hong Kong. Uh, they, they kind of want the stuff with very high beta. And um, they want the high beta stocks that uh, can outperform as quickly as possible. But interesting to hear you mention Gary Brinson there. We had a podcast interview recently with Brian Singer that was talking about uh, the early days of Brinson Partners, which be, then became a part of UBS. And that brings me to the topic of mentors and early influences. Who were some of your other mentors and early influences? You mentioned a couple already. Yeah, they, they, they were, the, the biggest investment influence on me was Gary Brinson, uh, Jeff Deermeyer, Brian Singer. Mm. That They led up the sort of the equity um, global equity as well as the asset allocation groups of Brinson Partners, which was folded into SBC as I started to work and then became UBS, Global Asset Management, which I, I stayed at for just over a decade. Okay. The deep valueness of, of Gary Brinson um, w was appealing to me. I, I don't know whether I became a value investor or I always was a value investor, but, it, but I understand I like to buy things cheap. Mm. Um, I'm willing to buy quality for a higher price, but it still has to be cheap versus what all quality investments would have. Mm -hmm. um, going through, and, and I was actually living and working in um, Chicago from the late 1990s through early 2000s. Um, I was doing uh, a Masters of Financial Mathematics at University of Chicago part-time and then working in the office full-time there um, for Brinson Partners. But just to see the management underperformance at that time and the dedication of Gary Brinson and Jeff Deermeyer to the process was, was enlightening for me. Mm -hmm. sort of, to, to think about underperforming the S&P by 10% in one year, your clients sticking with you and just never wavering on that strategy was, was one of my most formative experiences. Therefore, when you came through 2008, it was just another one of those experiences where you can truly say, and this too will pass. Um, the last three years, we went through a 
a, a value um, under performance of our asset allocation mutual fund in the US due to the, the massive outperformance of S&P versus everything else. And, and this too will pass. Um, the only strength you have in making sort of extra performance for your clients is being able to be dedicated to a cause and stay that for the long periods of times and long periods of underperformance and long periods of pain. Mm. During the late 1990s, um, Brinson Partners had inherited all the SBC uh, portfolios and every single one of the clients that they had inherited fired them. They didn't sign on to and weren't vested in the deep value philosophy. And as a result, this was a shock to them. Um, they were very happy with the outperformance when it was there, but they couldn't ride the underperformance. Okay. I'm intrigued by your comments about uh, the, the strength of resolve that the leadership at Brinson Partners had during that period. What do you attribute that to? Because it must have been psychologically very difficult to come into work and know that you're behind. And there's probably that nagging voice somewhere in the back of your head questioning what you're doing as you're seeing the results go against you. Why do you think you were able to stick it out? Now, what was the X factor? Um, it is the psychological resolve. Uh, in, in my over 20 years of investing, um, I think it has been sped on or, or reinforced by, by deep value investing at certain times. It is very, very difficult to have skill. I, I have seen some amount of skill in managers that, that you're able to secure through endowments, but it is a lot rarer than we actually think it is. Um, to add value, you need to find a local source of market abnormalities, and that local source generally is pain and discomfort. And pain and discomfort is something that an investment manager needs to be able to take and insulate the client from. You're really selling it. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> what is comfortable yeah. is rarely profitable. Yeah. I wake up each day and feel uncomfortable about my investments. Mm -hmm. If I'm comfortable, I know I'm not doing my job. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you need a very particular kind of client to be okay with that. Is there anything that you think fund managers can do to promote, I guess, a better understanding between uh, the, the manager and the client so that they've got the same expectations about the strategy as you've described it, that it's your job to go out there and, and be uncomfortable? So th there's two, two approaches that, that I see um, around the world for successful value add which is the, 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 there is a skill approach, rare, but it does exist. Uh, if you can't find those skilled managers, and I think that there are, the amount of money those managers manage is a very small proportion of the amount of money there is to manage. So most of them fall into the second group of um, harvesting behavioral biases um, within asset managers and within the markets. If you are in this environment or you're in these managers where you're taking advantage of a, of a market abnormality that's driven by behavioural biases, you have to overcome your own behavioural biases to do it. You will, as an investment manager, feel uncomfortable and you will be able to convince the client to maintain that strategy by doing one of two things. Um, one is pretending you are skilled. It is your job as a manager to make the client um, stay with that strategy through the cycle. And if you can feed him information so he has trust in you, whether that is economic information, whether that is knowledge of finance, whether that is a brand name, that is good because you are allowing that client to do something that they could not do themselves. The second approach, which is a lot of what research affiliates do is um, 
create a resolve during good times that will buffer them during the bad times. So during good times, this is not skill. This is luck. We did well. Do not expect it to always be this way, client. You should see performance on the downside of this magnitude as well. And when the bad times come, you have to say, I told you that this was going to come. Please be patient and you'll see the good times again. And then you'll see the bad times. And on average, you make money. It is my job as an investment manager to buffer the client from that pain. So you're a little bit like the slave that would ride in the carriage with the Roman general reminding him that thou art mortal when on parade. <laughs> yes, and, and I, I encourage uh, all of the people who work for me, and this is very much a um, ethos of research affiliates, is good times are lucky. You need to build client trust during those good times through telling them the truth about this is lucky. So that when bad times come, it's this is also lucky. It's bad luck, but it was random. It is not skill. I just want to circle back a little to something that you said uh, a little earlier about uh, your time in endowments. And during that time, you did notice that skill was possible but hard to find and generally very capacity constrained. What are the biggest differences and similarities between uh, working in asset management as you do now and as you did with Brinson Partners and working on the endowment side of things and you, you also work for a pension fund here in Australia. So what are the similarities and differences across the three areas of, of the investment business? The, the similarities and differences all come down to one thing, which is governance. There is a lot of talk about endowment model, how can you replicate the endowment model, what investments do they make, and in my view that completely misses the point. The difference between an endowment and a pension fund or a, a superannuation fund, industry fund, a retail fund here in Australia is the governance structure. Many pension funds have a time horizon longer than endowments. It's not the endowment's time horizon that gives its advantage. It's the fact that they have a governance structure that allows investments to have a longer period of time to pay off. That comes from very much one owner. We don't have multiple owners. You've sort of got one captive owner uh, of the assets. And you have professional boards, which are generally, and I don't know if this is just because of the success of investment people, or is something that can even go through periods like 1970 when, when it might be a lot tougher, but the board, investment boards are professional investors who have made a fair bit of money in um, both hedge funds, uh, long mutual fund companies, or private equities that are looking at the investments we're making and understanding that you need three or five years. Most of the investments that endowments make, the managers do not talk to anyone except once a year. That is the, the deal, I should say, or the, the benefit of endowments in that they can say, I only want to talk to you once a year. You're going to tell me that you've stuck to the strategy that we talked about because the staff of endowments are skilled investors, so it's very much a high level discussion. Anytime you ask for a quarterly meeting or talk about monthly performance, these managers will say, I have a queue of people on the door to come in. I don't need pension fund assets because you have to report to a pension fund board the structure that has been created is necessarily more short term and as a result you exclude yourself from all all or most of the skilled managers. I'm, I'm intrigued by your comment on the role that governance plays in the opportunities that are suitable for either an endowment or a pension fund. So given that pension funds have a very different governance model to an endowment, why do they all try to copy the endowment model? And what should they be doing instead? I think the work by Keith Ambisher is, is brilliant. 
he understands this kind of concept that it is the governance structure of pension funds that need to be um, changed to create avenues for outperformance. Uh, he has worked extensively on the Canadian side and as a result you'll notice that Canadian investors tend to be, uh, we could view them as more um, forward looking but it's really a case they've created a governance structure which allows them to take opportunities that um, other pension funds or maybe superannuation funds in Australia can't take. Hilda from Strategic Investment Group, who was one of the first outsourced CIO organisations in, in the US, where she and her team from the World Bank Pension Fund came out and set up an organisation, had a saying which was, um, you have to avoid bankruptcy of the decision-making process. Bankruptcy of the decision-making process is when the investment that you're undertaking cannot be fulfilled through the entire cycle because the, the governance or the decision-making process will lose faith. You have to only take positions that can withstand the full economic cycle. Otherwise, you are not guaranteed to have benchmark performance, but below benchmark performance, because you will always hire managers at the top and you will always fire managers on the bottom. You can't differentiate between trend and cycle, which is the greatest difficulty that we face as asset owners. I haven't heard anybody describe it as bankruptcy of governance before, but that's a, that's a very interesting and I think apt description. A key part of governance for most funds is a strategic asset allocation. And I'd like to ask you some questions about that and about asset allocation more broadly. But before I do that, I'd just like to read a response from an interview that the late, great Peter Bernstein gave uh, not long before he died, where he was asked about his views on strategic asset allocation and a change in those views. And this is what he said. For institutional investors, the policy portfolio, a rigid allocation like 60% stocks or 40% bonds, had become a way of passing the buck and avoiding decisions. The problem was that institutions had settled on a mostly stock allocation because, in the long run, they concluded that's the only place to be. And I think the long run ain't what it used to be. Stocks don't have to do well in the future because they did well in the past. In fact, the opposite may be more likely. As you know, I have my doubts about the certainty so many investors feel about the long run attraction of investing in stocks. We do not know what's going to happen over the long run, never have, never will. And when, in 1999, the institutional funds were relaxed about holding equities, it was a moment when equities were far away from anything resembling real value. Ben Graham said to invest with a margin of error so you don't get killed when you're wrong. They invested with a margin so small or non-existent that it meant they had to be right or they would get killed, and they were. Individuals can't ignore the asset allocation question. You want to have some structure as to where you want to be, and rebalancing is a wonderful form of market timing for in individuals, almost judgment-free. So I'd like to get your thoughts on this question of, is SAA you know, having a, a target mix? In Australia, it's more like 70-30 rather than 60-40. Is that a useful tool? Or should investors be thinking about their asset allocation and starting from a blank sheet of paper and building from there? I would recast the question, not is strategic asset allocation a useful tool, but it's, it's not useful, but it is necessary. So I have spent over two decades trying to find a way of managing money that doesn't, that allows you to be more active and further away from your peers. And in the end, it is so difficult over those shorter periods of time for a, a asset owner um, to justify that they're doing good, doing well, adding value, um, that the only performance 
that um, becomes important is your is your performance versus that strategic asset allocation or your peer group. Uh, the way I think of this is when a board looks at the performance of their fund, they have little choice. The only choice they have is to replace staff. Therefore, if they replace staff, they're going to replace it with other staff and therefore their only option is peer comparison. I haven't found a way to deal with that otherwise. So uh, you could view your strategic asset allocation um, as a performance benchmark. This is how you're going to be judged performance wise. I believe that um, from there, manage, um, staff at organisations or uh, advisors or whoever was running the, the, the strategy within uh, of a pool of money needs to diversify their investments broadly and with that they have opportunities to find not only active managers but they can take various smart beta type bets and then they could also do some active asset allocation if they have the tolerance to be able to do that. Okay, so you, you mentioned a couple of ideas there, uh, diversifying more broadly and active asset allocation. When you're talking about diversifying more broadly, what are some things that funds and investors can consider that might not be in their portfolios at the moment? Um, I would be considering the broadest range of investments that you can allocate to, including, of course, emerging markets um, equity, but emerging market debt, emerging market currencies. You should also consider bank loans, um, more income, sort of high yield uh, type securities, both on the short end and the long long end. Uh, those broad based allocations. It is difficult also within the equity space to have more diverse diversification than that, but you can think about different style managers of growth or value or momentum driven managers, uh, yield type portfolios that in Australia is a great benefit because of the franking credits, etc. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can look more broadly uh, at different asset classes or sub asset classes. Perhaps you can give us an example of how you might form capital market assumptions for these asset classes um, in, in working on your asset allocation. So we might pick emerging market equities as an example. How does Rafi go about setting reasonable expectations for what they think emerging market equities might do over the next 10 years, say? So w there are vo multiple time horizons. If we're considering the long-term time horizons, which, which we actually publish on the um, asset allocation interactive website of researchaffiliates.com, uh, it is very much a yield and carry type environment. Uh, we also create returns that are yield, carry and mean reversion type environment. So they are the long term sort of uh, investments. The driver in this case is you get what you pay for. If you're looking at equities and you have a certain dividend yield that you're buying, or you consider CAPE, in my view, they're pretty much the same, um, you will get that dividend yield plus some growth rate, and that will be your real return. Um, and when I say growth rate, I mean real growth rate. If you put a nominal growth rate, that's gonna be your nominal return. Um, that is probably the best indicator of a very, very long-term return buy and hold forever. We never buy and hold forever. We are investing our money for some purpose. Uh, as a result, you might have to pay a uh, income stream off it. You may have to liquidate it to, to pay out large payments. Whatever it is, we're not invested forever. So you do have to consider the capital price. The capital price and the dividend yield are very close in terms of concepts. When the dividend yield is very high, you're going to get not only greater carry, but a greater chance of reversion over a 10 to 20 year period. Likewise on the downside. So you'll see at the moment, emerging markets have quite a good dividend yield and um, earning 
capability and growth rate in comparison to something like US equities, which is the exact opposite. Just on this point of growth rates, uh, as I've always found in some ways that's the trickiest part of the of the three parts you mentioned to estimate because the, the dividend yield you know, it's a historical fact. The reversion to the mean, there's various ways you can estimate it, CAPE is one, but they all tend to give you fairly similar results, although the path to get there can be a bit different. The growth rate is the trickier one. Do you uh, simply assume that you're going back to a long-term historical average or do you use a forward-looking estimate? How do you think about economic or earnings growth? You have to be careful and understand that whatever you do is not perfect. As a result, there's probably good reasons to do it multiple ways and take the average. I think that the wisdom of the crowd is hard to overcome. So we look at historical return, uh, growth rates, particularly from the US, you take it from 1800, uh, in the 1800s, when we've got the data back from the Schiller database, it's, mm -hmm. it's, as, it's not only as good as anything, but uh, it's probably better than most. Um, you can then look at other markets that we have shorter term histories and not compare those two um, off the bat, but look at them over the given time periods that they're the same and then you can extrapolate back other data. The second one we look at is a difference between earnings yield and dividend yield. In theory, if earnings are all real and the difference between earnings and dividends is retained earnings and the earnings yield gives you an understanding of the return on reinvest capital, then the growth rate will be the difference between earnings yield and dividend yield. What I believe is that many markets have different quality of earnings. If you look at Russia, the earnings there seems to be very high compared to their growth rate. Why is that? Well, there seems to be some tax uh, on your particular earnings that doesn't get reinvested into, into um, growth rates. What could that be? It could be the fact that the earnings isn't real cash earnings, it's just a way of allocating uh, in having very, very high earnings for companies which justify owners extracting some of the wealth for themselves. And by owners, I don't mean us uh, external investors, I'm talking about the owners of that capital in the country to which they nicely allow us to ride along and short share a smaller proportion than they share. Very kind of them, isn't it? We've discussed estimating returns for equities where you've got these three components. There's the carry, a growth rate, and a mean reversion assumption. How about fixed income? How do you think about forward-looking returns for, say, global bonds? Something like a long-term 10-year bond is a lot easier than cash rate, which is surprising. <laughs> If you're investing with a 10-year type horizon, you want to know what the 10-year returns are going to be. And in terms of a 10-year bond, um, over the eight-year period, it doesn't matter. Because if yields go down, you can reinvest them. If they go up, you can reinvest them all at different rates, but it all washes out to probably the buy yield that you have. Um, this is where differences between nominal and real bonds come in, because we shouldn't really care about nominal returns at all. And as a result, the return you're going to get on a 10-year bond um, really depends on what inflation rates are going to be over that period of holding. As a result, predicting, I say in inverted commas, predicting inflation, which has proven to be one of the most difficult things, um, both within the academic and pr practitioner environment, is in some way essential. Um, it, in my view, is difficult to do better than looking at the market and looking at sort of break-even rates, taking into account um, risk premium differences between a tips bond and a, and a nominal bond. Um, the cash rate, so we, we have a inflation model which uh, isn't much more involved than, than looking at current inflation rates, inflation targets and credibility of um, central banks throughout the world. 
their ability to have hit the target in the past. Um, we also have real cash rate models which look at uh, what should the real cash rate be over the next 10 years compared to history and that is driven very much on views of GDP growth which is um, based off demographic type factors. Okay, so what we've discussed so far is, has been mainly at that longer term 10 year plus horizon. You mentioned that you also consider a shorter and medium term factors. What are some of the shorter and medium term factors you consider when uh, forecasting asset class returns? The Asset Allocation Interactive website, as I've said, presents 10 year numbers, which we think is a necessary but not sufficient um, set of information to manage money on, on any basis, whether it's being tactical or even strategic in some way. Uh, we are discussing bringing more shorter term um, expectations to the marketplace to assist and we will probably be doing that in the next year or two. But I can give you uh, a, an indication of the, some of the things we look at. Please. The, if we're looking at expected returns, I talked before about carry, which is if prices don't change, the return you will get, uh, carry plus growth. Um, if prices do change, but you hold it forever, that's the return you're going to get. Value, which is a longer term mean reversion, which although assets can move away from fair value due to uh, in asset allocation, macroeconomic and central bank behaviours, they cannot escape the law of um, the, the law of finance that in the end all assets should give us the same risk adjusted return. Um, but on that shorter term uh, analysis, we find that understanding global macroeconomic cycles both, as I said, globally, as well as locally, country by country, um, as well as momentum, in my view, actually two sides of the same coin becomes very important. So for example, if you have an economy that has um, weakened, spending is lower, you've got GDP growth low, below trend, or maybe even negative, every, every um, local institution will work to reverse that. They will work to increase employment, to increase spending. The government may do it. The central bank will lower real rates. There is an alignment to increase um, the, the local production within that, within that country, which will lead to better investment outcomes. On the Verse side, when the economy is doing very, very well, there is a alignment of the institutions to make that continue to happen. And that's why we end up getting bubbles in a way. There is no incentive for bubbles to be brought down because the institutions benefit from higher employment, higher growth rates. And until we see inflation that becomes extremely concerning, there isn't even a tamping on the, on the break for that. As a result, momentum, which looks at continuation of current cycles on the upside in good economic times, has to be factored in to your expected return. The simplest way of doing this is if something's running for you, don't rebalance or take profits until about a year is up. In good economic times, it can be longer than a year. On, on the verse side, when things are down, value reasserts itself and buying cheap becomes extremely profitable. So if I understand you correctly, you're almost talking about an asymmetric approach in that when things are, are positive, you're leaning perhaps a little bit more towards momentum, whereas when things are, are negative, the emphasis becomes more on value and being able to switch between the two sort of um, focuses. Is that correct? Or? That is exactly correct. We have done a lot of work internally over the last three to four years that 
that in many, many ways, in all different analysis, it's, it's talking about the same thing, which is during good times, momentum uh, is profitable. During bad times, value is profitable. And again, it's this, in the short run, the incentive of all institutions is to continue it. In bad times, it's the incentive of all institutions to reverse it. Mm. Um, therefore, momentum investing in good times, value investing in bad times, seems to be in asset allocation at least, which is driven very much off macroeconomic drivers, is the most profitable. I, th I think there's an interesting implication hidden in what you've just said as well, which is that your rebalancing regimen is regime dependent. Uh, this idea of we've got to square up to the asset allocation every month or when we hit X percentage tolerance band, it sounds like that's not the way you do it at RAFI. Uh, correct. At Research Affiliates, we um, rebalance naively on an annual basis and then non-naively we actually overlay and, and change that depending on global um, economic cycles. Okay. I don't think that the global economic cycles or the global business cycles can tell you on an individual basis wh whether a market is um, overvalued or undervalued in a way. But relatively, it'll tell you whether it's going to continue or it's going to reverse. Okay. So perhaps it'll help our listeners if we sort of bring some of these concepts together with an example. So we, we mentioned the approach to long-term returns and we note that uh, in the research affiliates research uh, emerging market equities look good from a long-term perspective. In the numbers I've seen they're sort of roughly long-term fair value relative to their own history but a lot cheaper than other countries around the world with a higher yield. But some of the shorter term numbers that have been coming out have been a little weaker. Obviously, momentum has slowed a little. So when it comes to sizing a position in your portfolio, how do you bring those things together? The sizing of positions in sort of an asset allocation framework is very challenging, particularly if the institutional knowledge is short. And I say institutional knowledge both of organisations such as ours that are taking asset allocation bets within an investment manager, as well as um, within staff at a pension fund or superannuation fund or an endowment or even the, the, the investment boards of, of such. You should end up taking the largest positions away from benchmark that don't cause bankruptcy of the decision making process. Um, in designing a strategy, uh, you can generate phenomenally high information ratios <laughs> that no one will invest in. Because during those bad periods of time in where the market is drawn down and you have lost money, they will lose faith in your positioning. You have lost too much money for them to, to prudently allow you uh, to continue managing the fund. On the upside, you may be taking money off the table early because you see, like we have now, um, the, the economic cycles or the investment cycles becoming very late stage. Uh, as a result, um, you need to have experience about how much capacity the investor has to um, withstand a period of bad performance. That's what I learned during the late 1990s. The investors that invested with Gary Brinson before the merger knew their capacity <laughs> to underperform. This was a portion of their portfolio where they may have had money with growth managers. As a result, they were trading off each other and they knew they had that capacity to withstand 10% underperformance. The investors that inherited this strategy didn't have that capacity. They hadn't, hadn't experienced that drawdown before. And during good times, they're saying, of course I can hold, of course I can get through that. But when it came to it, they couldn't. 
So the difficulty with sizing is actually understanding what is the capacity for you to perform badly and maintain invested in the strategy. So if I understand you correctly, there's a, a hidden lesson in your comment, and that is that knowing yourself as an investor is perhaps as important, maybe even more important than the strategy that you're implementing, uh, because uh, the limits to the strategy are your behavior. Exactly. So first, if you know your own, as well as the group that is making decisions with you, capacity to invest, capacity to feel uncomfortable, um, to have the ability to stay with an investment that has lost money when every single person around you is telling you you are wrong and the greatest critic will be yourself and your own self-doubt. Once you know that, then you're able to actually decide what is the strategy I'm able to implement? It, it's funny because it's as if that wasn't enough. Uh, in my experience, I've seen the problem gets compounded because not only do the, the, you have to know the limits of the people involved, the people involved change. There's rotation on board, staff come in and out, and the natural tendency is you look at all of the things that have underperformed over two or three years, and sort of look at that and say, who put that in the portfolio? And the institutional knowledge, the reasons why, is, is lost by that time. And it almost sets organizations up for exactly the kind of behaviors that, um, that we've been talking about. But just to shift gear a little bit, we mentioned earlier when we were talking about estimating returns, the cyclically adjusted PE ratio or the CAPE ratio. Now, Research Affiliates recently wrote a paper defending the CAPE ratio. Can you take us through your thinking about some of the many criticisms of the CAPE ratio? Because they've been starting to stack up recently. For example, that um, part of it's the effect of the the big fall in earnings in 2008, which will now fall out of the series after 10 years. Um, changes to the mix of companies and sectors, the fact that we have less industrials, more services, less capital intensive, more capital light. Companies that have higher profit margins, differences between gap accounting and operating earnings, more earnings coming from overseas, changes to tax rates, changes to brokerage costs. People obviously uh, required a higher um, equity risk premium when brokerage was more expensive, less so now that it's easier to trade, and the incentives for corporate leaders, the, uh, the emergence of buybacks and stock options and how that changes behavior. Have I left any criticisms out? <laughs> I'm interested to know why you, why you stick with CAPE. Well, one of the benefits of research affiliates is that we are quite inclusive of different views. Um, whereas um, I know Rob's uh, view is CAPE is a great approach and, and these criticisms are overblown. My view is I think that they have some good points, but it doesn't matter. So when we look at various factors, such as I'll take the, the three big that I've got three big ones that I have actually faith in um, carry value and momentum. There is latent variables behind those. So if we look at value, there is a latent variable that causes prices to mean revert. And the relationship that the market has to those variables, those latent variables, which we cannot observe, is changing. Therefore, when we look at history, in my view, it is not possible to find a variable that is the right one. There is no observable variable that is true. As a result, to deeply adjust something like CAPE to try to come up with a better measure sort of misses the point that only in hindsight can you come up with a perfect variable that would have worked and understand what the relationship was. My approach very much is since the variables are 
are changing and the relationship to the value latent variable is changing, you should actually look at multiple variables over time. I think that some that, that virtually all of these um, adjustments and and their impact on value investing in the forward is in in the future is massively overblown. The best one I like is that 2008 will come out of the number and it will jump. Therefore, there is less continuity in CAPE for a short period of time. I think that that's that's a a good thoughtful. Um, uh, criticism but if you're looking to look at it in the cross-section which is really how you end up using it it's a lot less of a concern than people would have uh, it's interesting to hear you say that because that I guess backs up uh, some of the work that I've done on it because when you run some of these adjustments through the Cape all it does is shift it from extremely overvalued to very overvalued so the answer is still things are very overvalued um, perhaps not as much as it might at first appear, but still very overvalued. I just want to drill in a little bit further on something that you said about uh, using the CAPE cross-sectionally. And I'm guessing that you're referring to comparing countries rather than deciding whether to be in or out of the market sort of totally. So why is CAPE still a useful model for comparing across countries or markets, even though it may not be right? The reason it's useful across countries, even though it's not right, is there is no right. We cannot observe a right. We actually don't know um, the true drivers of value. What is the true valuation? Um, all we know is that you have a cross-sectional movement of, of equity markets that move away from where they should be and that any normalisation of those prices will give you an anchor point to rebalance. For example, you can take the last five years performance of asset classes and the, in, the, the negative of that is a really great indicator of value. You don't need to go and say, um, let's look at it versus book value or let's look at it versus earnings. From an asset allocation point of view, CAPE gives you equities, but how do we judge that versus bonds or versus high yield? It becomes more challenging. So one measure, CAPE, is as good as many other measures, but historical five-year performance is pretty good. We published um, at the beginning of this year, an article in the Journal of, of Investment Management on the benefit of uh, asset allocation occurs only with very, very diversified investments where you can take a lot of cross-sectional bets. If someone came and said, I wish to know how to allocate in my 60-40 um, domestic port, um, portfolio, my answer is don't. Rebalance once a year, rebalance one twelfth of your portfolio monthly, and that's the, as good as you're going to do because the bet you would do of bond versus equity will take far longer to, to benefit you than your tolerance. And if for some reason you've got a long tolerance, it better be your own money because if, it's, uh, if you have a board in front on top of you, it's longer than their horizon has. Yeah. Asset allocation is still a very, very broad bet that you need to place. It's interesting to hear you make that point about uh, a model such as CAPE or even five-year historical returns still being useful in terms of ranking your options and still being able to profit from that model through that ranking process and the need to be as diverse as possible so that you can essentially rank as many different opportunities as you can and run them head to head. It's, a, it's an interesting way of constructing portfolios and quite different to this static 70-30 that we started talking about earlier where most people sort of start with that, that benchmark, uh, I guess, Im imposed on them by peer group comparisons. We think about three sources of value. 
So if you have a performance benchmark, then you can make a strategic benchmark for yourself that is far more diversified. Uh, you rebalance that on an annual rolling basis. I like the one twelfth a month. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't end up with sort of selection day. Mm -hmm. Same expected return, but less regret in doing it that way. And that portfolio will have a small increase in return over your performance benchmark. Um, on top of that, you can do the ranking and, and add active allocation between those um, diff 20 to 30 different options uh, to gain asset allocation uh, return. And we estimate you can add about a percent for that. And then the fourth one is stock selection. Choosing managers or active, active allocations within those particular asset classes to do better. And that, that really depends on your governance structure and, and how much you can do on that as well. Moving on to another devil's advocate question, and this is a question related more to factor research. Uh, research Affiliates has published a lot of information on factors and whether or not the premiums that those factors have earned are due to a persistent revaluation of the factor over time. In other words, they've become more expensive and the premium isn't really a premium, it's a one-off valuation adjustment that makes these factors quite dangerous. And there's been some pretty strong criticism of this research by everybody in the quant factor community, understandably. Um, most notably from Cliff Asness at AQR. What is it that these other quants are missing in their side of the debate, do you think? We have been doing a lot of work with um, Cam Harvey, and he has a, he, he's actually a member of our, um, he's a partner within our organisation now, so um, we'll sort of disclose that. But he has written um, a paper on SSRN called Lucky Factors. And it's changed name over time and they've updated, they updated it I think at the end of last year. And at the end of last year, they identified that the quant community has 330 different factors which add value in a statistical framework. I don't know what the right number is, but I have faith in three. Um, to be honest, within equity, cross-sectional, um, I think that you have some sort of value, some sort of momentum, and some sort of um, quality type measures. So that's three. Maybe volatility, but I think volatility is driven by um, some additional rebalancing premiums that you're taking advantage of and therefore justifiable. Um, when a quant manager is um, is managing money or, or when a quant manager is looking for a strategy that's working, there is a payoff in our industry currently for complexity. Um, we find it difficult and we get really like substantial pushback on just having simple factors. I think what people need to understand is that simple isn't easy, it's actually a step beyond complexity. To, to look at um, our risk premium, our alternative risk premium product, which is driven purely by three simple factors, you need to go through the three to four years we spent in looking at all the complexity of the markets, understanding this evolving um, framework of latent exposures to a true unobservable driver and then say taking three or four different value measures averaging them which is what we have done with the uh, RAFI smart beta uh, approach is robust and difficult it's difficult to understand that back tests tell you what the relationships were and a lot of those are spurious relationships and if you look at um, the return for the majority of the community, it's coming from those three drivers and the complexity that they add by these additional 
factors or tweaking the factor the factor definition so it's it's better than everyone else is story only it is probably uncomfortable for us to come out and say no the majority of the complexity that you quant managers who have large education in quantitative methods isn't valuable i myself has two masters degree in math and understand the complexity they're going through and how little value it will produce out of sample. It does give the client the ability to feel comfortable with that manager because the client may think that a simple approach is too simple. It's, it's sort of like the, the doctor type approach. You want your doctor to be somewhat impersonal so he can do a really good job for you. Where in reality, uh, just the simplest driving features are how you will actually get your forward return. So it sounds like this is going to have to prove itself over time. It, yes, it will. And that's where not only factor investing and factor timing for us is very much an extension of asset allocation, but within, but within sort of the smart beta RAFI, the fundamental index that we've done for over 10 years, it's, it's proven out. We've taken really simple measures, we've taken averages of them, we've managed that actively out of sample for 10 years where we can say, see, simple works. It's not easy. Don't confuse simple with easy. Simple works. And value, carry and momentum are already out of sample. They've been discovered years and years ago and they continue to add value. The more new portfolio, the new strategies that people have, are only time will tell whether they pay off, but my bet very much is they won't add any more than their correlation to carry value and momentum. So they'll seem to work, but they won't do any better than a simple approach. So simple is not easy, I like that. So you're back in Melbourne shortly and I think a couple of weeks from now you'll be back in Melbourne permanently. Tell us a little bit about what you'll be doing here. Uh, Research Affiliates has uh, a business model that usually requires some explaining because in, in some sense we're not a traditional investment manager. We do what we uh, believe we do well which is research and portfolio construction we don't do what we believe other people could do as well as or better than us. We don't have a trading desk. We don't invest the money directly ourselves because there are uh, partners out there that can do it just as well. Why would we move our organization from the 80 people we currently have that, that can know everyone know what everyone else is doing and reflect on everything to have a much larger organization where that incremental benefit is not where our experience is. So um, we have affiliates around the world that leverage our research, hence the name Research Affiliates, um, to deliver actual investments to clients. Uh, some of those are done through swap structures, sort of your traditional um, active sort of, uh, do, uh, sorry, passive implementers. The, the big investment banks like State Street around the world um, will take indices and invest those. Right through to uh, locally, we have implementers um, that will take a portfolio and more trade need, need to be more um, careful in the trading and implementing uh, careful. So we've got, um, uh, Real Index here that does that for, for Australian RAFI type portfolios. They do some of their own things on top of it, uh, but the base is, is the fundamental index, as well as um, in the US, we've worked with Parametric for nearly 10 years in terms of implementation, both of direct equities as well as um, um, futures and, and swaps through their Minneapolis office and we will be working with them for more of our active allocations for um, alternative risk premium type products as well as maybe uh, tax advantaged uh, RAFI investments. Okay, sounds very interesting. 
Now, I'd like to get your thoughts on these sorts of multi-asset products and the opinion that these products have in the marketplace. So something that I've observed is that asset consultants in Australia seem to have changed their views about these sorts of strategies. At, at first, um, I think they referred to them as diversified growth funds. They seem to think that they would be a good uh, one-stop shop for smaller funds as an asset allocation solution or a flexible component of a larger funds portfolio or perhaps even an opportunity for a fund to improve their own asset allocation by learning from a fund manager by working with them. But more recently they seem to have changed their mind on all of those issues. Uh, perhaps it has something to do with some of them starting their own outsourced CIO businesses, but I'll just put that out there. Um, and they've been stating that a lot of these funds simply provide betas that are already in the broader portfolio of the client that the flexibility that these strategies are supposed to have hasn't really translated into outperformance over a, a static SAA and that the knowledge transfer has been disappointing. What do you think the consultants are missing? Not much. <laughs> it's an I, honest I, answer. <laughs> I think that their view is somewhat correct. For example, knowledge transfer um, is always going to be disappointing because what they learnt is that the manager was giving them protection from dis uncomfortable investing and that the strategies they would have to implement themselves will be very uncomfortable. Um, we have an alternative risk premium product that we launched in the US a year ago and as we launched it, internally and in through parametric were uncomfortable with the positions in the portfolio they said this is a larger position than we've had historically is something broken so questioning if a strategy is broken on launch sort of yeah. <laughs> makes me chuckle because yeah. yeah that's how you get the return and we we stood by that and said no the opportunities are great, and that portfolio is out, sort of given a market neutral twenty percent return in the last year. Why? Because the opportunities were so great, and the discomfort was great. So, the, I think the movement of um, funds towards creating alternative risk premium buckets and looking at active asset allocation within al an alternative risk premium bucket is a good move because you can then create return to that type of strategy. If you had no behavioral biases, the portfolio that I think would be best would be a beta exposure to your performance benchmark and then 100% in global macro type strategies. But no one, including myself, could withstand that. So it's a case of what can you do? How much can you take? But there isn't anything that you can learn from them that I can't tell you in two minutes, which is look at value, look at carry, look at momentum, equal weight them and put that position on and never question. That will give you return. Therefore, what is the knowledge transfer that you can get apart from getting deeply involved with that manager and feeling his pain and understanding that you can overcome that pain and invest that way, that's the only thing you could really learn and there really shouldn't be and isn't a desire to go through that. I think most people don't want to learn that lesson, if they can help it anyway. So it sounds like we'll be hearing um, more from you over the coming months and years and your collaboration with Parametric on alternative risk premium. So we look forward to that. Um, thank you very much for coming in today, Mike, and for sharing your thoughts on all things asset allocation, factors, answering some of my devil's advocate questions. It's been really great chatting with you. Thanks, Daniel. I've really enjoyed it. Hopefully we can do it again soon. Thank you for listening to the i3 Insights Podcast. For more information, please visit our website at www.i3-invest.com. Thank you.